Today I'm going to share with you a good old-fashioned cabin in the woods scary story. It happened in 1991 in West Virginia and boy is it a good one. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. If that's of interest to you, then please take all of the like button's white clothes and wash them with a brand new red shirt. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 1991, Brian Kendall and his young family were tired of living the busy city life. He worked in Baltimore, Maryland. He was a carpenter by trade, but he and his wife, Belinda, had grown up in the country in West Virginia, and they decided to move back there, even though that would mean a multi-hour long commute for Brian to get back to Baltimore to do work, because he still worked in Baltimore. So Brian and Belinda start looking for places to live in West Virginia, and they find this nice home in Slainsville, West Virginia, which has a population of 182 people, last time I checked. The house itself had more of a cabin feel to it. I mean, it was way out in the middle of this forest, no neighbors anywhere. It was a ranch style, so single floor, and basically everywhere you looked was just pure forest. So this cabin is super isolated, but Brian and Belinda had come from a neighborhood that wasn't very safe, and they didn't like sending their kids outside without supervision. Now, living in the middle of nowhere, they could at least let their kids go outside and not really worry about them. So even though it might have been lonely, they felt like it was at least safe. And Brian went out and got a beautiful, friendly, black lab dog to come and protect the property, and her name was Coco. They loved Coco. She was very protective of the kids right away and she blended in with the family immediately and very quickly the family really took to living in Slainsville. They loved their new home and their new life. Everything was just going so well at first. Shortly after they had moved into the house and finally unpacked, Belinda invited her brother as well as her brother's wife and daughter named Jordan to come over and check out the house. And so they come over, Belinda had gotten a cake and some balloons, and she planned on throwing a little mini surprise party for Jordan, who was about the same age as her kids and had recently had a birthday. And so they figured they would surprise her, give her some cake and have a little impromptu birthday party. After cake, the kids went into the living room and were playing in there together. The living room was right next to the kitchen, and so the adults were in the kitchen having coffee and chatting, and as they're chatting, they all notice something very strange going on in the living room with the kids. The kids had taken all of the balloons and brought them into the living room, and they had all floated up to the ceiling, and there was pretty high ceilings inside of this living room. And as the adults are looking in the direction of the kids and these balloons, they notice one of the balloons comes down from the ceiling, but the string is tight, as if someone's holding the balloon and pulling it down, but no one was pulling on the balloon. The adults stopped talking and they've all noticed this and they're all looking at it because it looked very unnatural. The balloon stops right in the middle of the room and it's a ways away from the kids and the kids haven't noticed it. And the parents are just quietly watching this balloon and no one knows what to make of it. No one's even commenting that this is happening. They're all just quiet and watching. And the balloon starts moving across the room over to where Jordan was. Jordan notices the balloon for the first time. She turns and goes, thank you, as if she's talking to someone, but no one's there. She reaches out to take the balloon and as she goes to grab it, it drifts right back up to the ceiling as if someone had been holding it and let go of it. And Jordan like kind of grabbed for it, watched it go to the ceiling, and then Jordan just turned around and kept on playing. That startled everybody. They could make sense of a balloon coming down and then moving. The helium could be leaking, there could be a draft in the room, but for it to go right back up and look like someone had released it, they couldn't explain that. And so the parents go right in the living room. They're looking at each other. The parents are, and they're like, did you see that? What was that about? And they grab that balloon down from the ceiling and they're trying to like replicate what they saw. And they're kind of looking at each other like, are we going crazy? And they go over to Jordan and they say, hey, who are you talking to a minute ago? And she couldn't really articulate anything. And they said, when the balloon was right here in front of you, who are you talking to? And she stops and kind of thinks about it for a second. She's a young kid, you know, she's, she's like two or three years old. She thinks about it and she points in the direction where no one's standing and goes, him. The parents look in the direction of where she's pointing. They look at each other and then they start laughing because they're like, okay, we're scaring ourselves. Obviously, you know, the helium must have come out and maybe there's a draft and, and she's three. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's probably got an imaginary friend. Like, we're just scaring each other. Let's just drop it. Let's forget the balloon. And so they do. They forget the balloon and they don't think about it again. 
But after Jordan and her parents leave, Belinda and Brian would say to each other like, that was pretty weird. A couple of days later, Brian asked his daughter, Blair, who was about five or six years old, if she wanted to come with him and go explore the back forest behind their property because Brian had been working so much, he hadn't really had a chance to go explore and he figured now's a good chance to go. Blair's super excited. The two of them go out into the backyard and they start walking around. And after walking a bit of a ways, they stop because they see something in the middle of the forest that shouldn't have been there. They see this van, like a vehicle, that looked like it had been set on fire at one point. It's totally charred. It's basically just the frame. And it's parked in the middle of the forest. And there are no roads anywhere. And they go in the back of the vehicle and look inside. And there are all these burnt stuffed animals and kids toys that are in the back of this van. And there is what looks to be the spring of a mattress that must have been caught up in this fire that burned the vehicle. And Brian just had this sinking feeling that something was wrong with this scene. And he said, hey, you know what, Blair, we got to go. Let's not look at this. We don't know what this is. Let's just go. When they get back to the house, Brian would tell Belinda what he found. How would that van have gotten there? And why was it? It there. It just didn't make any sense to either of them. Over the first couple of months that they were living in Slainsville, Brian was trying to commute daily to his work in Maryland, but it was taking up hours and hours of his day. He was getting no sleep and it just didn't make sense. And so even though they only had one car, he started commuting on Monday morning to work and then staying with his mom who lived in Maryland and then coming back to Slainsville on Friday night, which would mean that every week, Monday to Friday, Belinda and the kids would be alone in their cabin in the woods in Slainsville with no vehicle. But Belinda had grown up in a very isolated house in the middle of a forest in West Virginia. So she wasn't a stranger to this type of setup and so really didn't have any issues with this lifestyle that they had in Slainsville. Blair had been asking ever since they moved in if she could go camping one night out in their RV. They had a little RV camper that was parked right outside their property and she wanted to spend a night out there by herself. And so one week when Brian was away for work, Belinda finally caved and said, okay, Blair, you can stay in the camper tonight. She wasn't thrilled about this idea, but she felt like the kids had a little bit of cabin fever going on because they were so cooped up in this house. And she figured this is an easy way to make Blair feel a little bit happier living here. So she told Blair, once you go in there, I want you to lock the door and not open it again. And Coco, their dog, is going to stay with you. Blair was just fine with this setup. And so that night she went out to the camper. She had Coco with her. She had all her warm clothes on. She brought a, a lantern with her and some books she was going to read. She goes out and her mom tucks her into her bed inside of the RV and gives her a kiss. And then she leaves. In the camper, there was a pull-out bed that she was on that took up the majority of the floor space in the camper. On her right, as she was laying down, was a big window with a blackout curtain that slid across the whole thing and she kept that curtain shut. At the foot of her bed to the right was the door that led into the camper and there was a window on that as well, but there was no blind to block it. And so at some point Blair is tired, she turns off her lantern and she gets under her covers with Coco right next to her and she goes to sleep. At some point in the night, Blair wakes up suddenly because Coco is acting really strange. She's very uneasy and she's looking towards the door that leads into the camper and she's acting like she just saw something. So Blair sits up, she's trying to calm down Coco and she looks at the window on the door and she can look outside. There's a little bit of moonlight outside. So she's got a little bit of illumination. And as she's looking, she sees what looks like a figure walk past the door. She can't tell if it's a person or if it's an animal or what it is, but she definitely saw something walk past the door and Coco clearly saw saw it too because Coco begins growling and instead of just looking at the door where this figure was, Coco basically follows the figure and is now looking at the window right next to Blair. Blair thinks it's her mom. And so she tries to calm down Coco. She turns on her lantern and she goes to the front door and she peeks her head out. She doesn't see anything. She unlocks it and opens it and pokes her head out. She doesn't see her and she goes, mom? And there's no one out there. She looks up at the house, which is right next to her and all the lights are off. There's no sign that her mom left the house. Suddenly feeling really startled, she shuts the door, locks it, and goes back in her bed. Now, the whole time that Blair had turned that lantern on and gone down to the door and yelled for her mom, Coco was still on the bed looking at the window where the blackout curtains were covering up whatever was on the other side. Now, when Blair's going back to the bed, Coco is showing her teeth. She's baring her teeth and she's growling at the window. Blair's totally spooked. She jumps into her bed, throws the covers over her head, and she's sitting there hoping that Coco will just stop and that this will all end and she can go to sleep, but Coco doesn't stop. And she's like reaching out and trying to pull Coco to get under the covers with her, but Coco won't stop. Blair decides she has to take a look out that window and she thinks maybe it is my mom. 
Maybe I just missed her before and she's trying to come in. Maybe she was knocking and it, I didn't hear her. And so she takes her covers off her head, gets right up next to the side of the wall. She's underneath the window, which is right next to her. And she starts pulling aside that curtain. And as soon as she's got a view out the window, she sees a dark figure that looks like a man or something standing right outside the glass, looking down into her camper. She's so scared. She drops the curtain and just gets under her covers. Coco goes right on top of Blair and is standing over Blair, basically protecting her. And at some point, Blair does manage to fall asleep. Meanwhile, on the same night, there was some other drama happening up at the main house. Belinda had put Blair's younger brother, Sean, to bed almost immediately after she tucked in Blair inside of the camper. Sean was three years old and he was a great sleeper. She could put him in his bed, say goodnight to him, and she wouldn't see him until the next morning. But that night, Belinda was laying in bed and Sean multiple times would get out of his bed and come into her bedroom and say he was scared and didn't want to be in his room. Belinda would get up, she'd go back, she'd tuck him back in and say, you got nothing to worry about, it's just a new house, you're fine, you're safe. But on the third or fourth time that this happened, because it was so out of character, she asked Sean, what's going on? What are you so scared of? And he says, there's a monster in my window. Belinda assumes what he means is maybe a deer was outside or some other animal might have walked by the window because in virtue of being a single story house, all of the bedroom windows are at ground level. And so she goes to the window and she looks out and it's just forest, deep, dark forest everywhere you look. And so she's thinking, okay, maybe a deer walked by the window or, or a moose or something like that. And that's what he saw. And so she was able to explain to him that, you know, it's just a new house. There's probably some deer that are coming by the window. You got nothing to worry about. And so she was able to finally calm him down and he would go to sleep. The next morning, Blair is relieved to wake up and have sunlight be coming through that little open window on the front door. She and Coco go into the main house. She sits down for breakfast with her mom and with her brother. And Belinda asks her, how was camping? And Blair, who was normally a very chatty child, was very quiet about it. And her mom said, well, did you have a good time? Like, you can tell me anything about it? And Blair just said, you know, I don't think I wanna go camping again. And she didn't elaborate. She just didn't wanna talk about it. And so Belinda didn't ask any more questions and that was that. That day goes by without incident. And then that night, Belinda gets Sean and Blair to bed in their normal rooms. They're asleep. Belinda goes to her bed and she falls asleep. And she starts to have this very strange dream. In her dream, she wakes up and looks at the foot of her bed and she sees a boy, a boy she doesn't recognize. And he's signaling her to come with him. And so in her dream, she gets up out of her bed and she follows him out of her room and she goes out to the front yard and it's daylight outside. And on her front yard are all these clotheslines strung all over the front yard. And there are these white sheets that are hanging from each of these clotheslines, all in different random directions. And she's trying to find this boy and she can't find him because all the sheets keep getting in her way. She finally stops because she feels something on her toe. And she looks down, she's barefoot, and on her right big toe is a clothespin that had been pinched onto her toe. And so she reaches down and pulls it off and that's when she wakes up. And now she's awake in real life. And so she sits up and she's kind of looking around and she's in that immediate fog following a really vivid dream. And then she realizes that was just a dream, gets back in bed and she goes to sleep. The next day she gets up, she gets out of her bed and she begins pulling her blankets up to make her bed. As she's walking around the foot of the bed, she stops because she sees something on the ground. A clothespin. They don't own any clothespins. And so she's sitting there looking at it thinking, how could that have gotten there? What was that dream about? Was I awake? Was I doing something in my sleep? Was I sleepwalking? She can't make sense of it, but it totally freaked her out. That day, Belinda told her sister about this dream with the clothespin and then finding it at the foot of the bed. And her sister's like, look, you probably just need a break. You're, you're alone with the kids all the time. You're isolated. Let me come over. I'll watch the kids and you can just go for a walk and, and do whatever. Just clear, clear your mind. And so Belinda's sister comes over, takes the kids and Belinda decides that what she's going to do is go explore the woods behind their house. She walks a little ways behind their property and she sees something that really stands out to her. It was a little cemetery and it was on their property or at least close to their property. She goes over to it and sees there are four small headstones. There's no writing on them, but the size of the headstone themselves, it seemed to indicate that these could have been children. And so she was very unsettled by it and decided that, you know what, I'm done with my walk and I'm just gonna go back now. A couple of days later, Blair was sleeping in her room when she woke up suddenly for no apparent reason. She sat up, she kind of looked around and she noticed that the curtains that normally would cover up her window that overlooked her bed were open. 
And she felt really uneasy by this, especially after that incident in the RV. She liked having those curtains closed. So she gets up to go over and shut this curtain and she looks out the window and she sees standing in front of the tree line is a dark silhouette of a figure. It looks like a man or some person. And she freezes and she's looking at it and she can tell that it's moving towards her. And she's looking even closer and then she can tell it's now running at her. She shuts it, jumps into her bed and covers herself up. As she's laying there under her covers, not knowing what to do, she hears Coco barking from her mom's room. Belinda wakes up to Coco barking and looks at what she's looking at and it's the window. So Belinda gets up, she looks out the window, she doesn't see anything and tells Coco to calm down. She figured, okay, maybe she saw a deer or something. And then just to be a good mom, she checks on her kids. She goes to Sean's room. Sean didn't wake up from the barking. He's asleep in his bed. But when Belinda goes into Blair's room, Blair is hiding under her covers and she's scared of something. And she asks Blair, honey, what's wrong? And Blair finally says that she saw something. She thought it was a person. She didn't know what, but it was running towards the house. And so Belinda's thinking to herself, she just saw an animal because that's probably what Sean saw when he thought he saw a monster outside. And I'm sure that's what Coco saw. You know, Coco's gonna react to an animal. There's probably some deer that's coming right up to the window and it's scaring my kids, it's scaring my dog. And so Belinda tells Blair, you got nothing to worry about, honey. Go back to sleep, everything's gonna be fine. She calms her down, she puts her to sleep. She double checks on Sean, Sean's still sleeping. And Belinda and Coco go back into Belinda's room and they get in bed and Belinda goes back to sleep. At some point in the night, Belinda's laying with her back to the door and she feels someone tapping on the back of her head. And she's assuming at this point, it's gotta be Sean or even Blair who've come in there because they're scared again. And reflexively, without even opening her eyes, she says, honey, there's nothing outside. You get nothing to be scared of, go back to sleep. There's a silence and then she feels tapping on her head again. Now she opens her eyes and she rolls over to tell one of her two kids that everything's fine, but there's no one there. It startles her because not only is there no one there, but Coco is now on the bed growling in the direction of wherever this tapping was coming from. Immediately, Belinda flips on the light and she's looking around her room and there's nothing. Gets up and she goes into her kids' rooms. They are fast asleep. Just to be sure, she walks around the house, makes sure everything is locked. She gets back in her bed and she's sitting there with Coco and she can't help it, she's scared. Between her kids seeing stuff outside, finding that cemetery, the, the weird clothespin thing going on, now something feeling like it was tapping her but no one's in the room with her, she's scared. And in fact, she would say in interviews that this was the first time that she even thought about the word haunted in relationship to what was going on at their house. The next day, Belinda just wanted to get away from the house. So she calls her mom and says, hey, can we use your car for the day to go run some errands? Her mom says, absolutely. Her mom drops the car off and Belinda and the kids load up and they head into town. When they left, they put Coco in her outdoor cage totally locked and secure. So they head out and they go to this gas station in Slainsville and Belinda gets out, she's fueling up her car and another resident of Slainsville pulls up right next to her and she's filling up her car. And the two women strike up a conversation. At some point in this discussion, the woman asks Belinda where she lives in Slainsville because she's a longtime resident and she didn't recognize Belinda. Belinda describes where she lives and the woman who's familiar with the area says, well, do you know the story of your property? And Belinda's like, no. She's like, well, years and years ago, there was a really bad fire. I think it was right near your property that a whole family died in. And Belinda says, you know what? I actually found a small cemetery a little ways back on our property, but that's what it is. As Belinda is driving away and she's thinking about the story she's been told, she has this sense of relief that now she has some closure on why there's that cemetery on her property. And she couldn't help but think if her house is haunted, which she had only recently considered, Maybe it's not such a bad thing to have it be this family that's doing the haunting. It didn't feel evil, it just felt kind of sad and she was empathetic for this lost family. When they got back from running those errands, Coco was gone. They went to the fence and it hadn't been opened. There was no sign that she'd been able to burrow underneath this fence. There was no way for her to get out unless you opened the gate and it was locked and shut. And so they didn't know what to make of that. And the only thing they could come up with is someone must have taken Coco. And unfortunately, they would never see Coco again. It was a huge loss for this family. Coco was not only a dog they loved and considered part of their family, but she was also their protection and it was, it was a very big deal that she was gone. A couple of days go by and Brian's home from work and everyone in the house is asleep except for Belinda. Belinda was up watching TV. And at some point she turns off the TV and she also goes to bed. 
She starts having the same dream she had when she felt that clothespin on her toe. In her dream, she wakes up and at the foot of her bed is this boy, the same boy that she had followed outside that she could never find in the sheets. And so she gets up and, and she starts following this boy. He brings her out to the front of the house, out onto the front yard. And again, the whole front yard is covered in these white sheets that are strung up along clotheslines. And as she's making her way across the front yard, pulling sheets aside, she finally reaches a clearing and she sees this boy who looks like about the same age as her son, Sean. And this boy looks terrified and she's looking at him and the boy is kind of looking to his left. And then from behind one of the sheets next to the boy, walks this dark figure that stands right next to him and looks up at her. And it's an expressionless dark figure. It almost looks like a man. And it starts walking up the lane of sheets towards her. She falls over backwards and she wakes up. And when she wakes up in real life, she hears screaming coming from her own son's room. She and Brian jump up out of bed and run into Sean's room. He's laying on the ground with his arm cocked to the side. It's clearly been broken. And he's screaming and guarding his arm. And Belinda's over him saying, what happened? What happened? And the boy just says, the monster came in the window. They don't know what to make of this. They're not sure if that means an intruder came in or what, but they have to get him to the hospital. They scoop him up, they grab Blair and they get in the car and they leave. They get Sean to the hospital and sure enough, he's got a very bad break in his arm and he needs to stay at the hospital for a couple of days. Now this happened on a Sunday night and so Brian had to go back to Maryland the next day for work. So their car was gone. So three days later when it was time to get Sean, Belinda had to borrow her mother's car to go pick him up. So Belinda gets her mother's car and she and Blair drive to the hospital. They pick up Sean. As they're driving back, the car breaks down and they're on the side of the road with flashers on and Belinda doesn't know what to do. Luckily, a good Samaritan is driving by. Another resident of Slainsville sees them pulled over. She pulls over, it's an older woman, and she says, hey, can I give you guys a ride? Belinda's like, thank you, yes, we need a ride. So she, Sean, and Blair load up in the car and they start driving to their house. And so Belinda tells tells this woman where she lives. Yep, you take this road, you get up to our house, it's set back in the woods there. And when she realizes where Belinda lives, she looks at Belinda and goes, you do know the history of your house, right? And Belinda looks at her and goes, yeah, the, the fire that, that, that killed the family, we're aware. She goes, no, not a fire. The last occupant of your house was rumored to be hurting children on your property. And there's no proof, but some of the local men here decided they were gonna take justice into their own hands and they convinced this guy to go hunting with them. And they brought him out in the woods behind his house and they ambushed him and his body's never been found. It's rumored there's a van somewhere in the woods near your house where they put him inside of it, shut the doors and lit it on fire. Belinda's in shock hearing this because now if her house is haunted, which she's believing it is, it's not some nice family that was sadly lost in a fire. It's this horrible man. They finally got back to the house. They said bye to the woman and Belinda and her kids went inside. And for Belinda, it was like this horrible sense of dread being in the house. It just felt evil. And she realized that she couldn't stay there anymore. So she picks up the phone, she calls Brian and she says, I cannot stay here another night. I have to go. And so Brian says, okay. He drives back from Maryland. They pack some bags, they get in his car and they all leave for Brian's mom's house. And that was it. They never stayed another night at that house. They only went back a couple times to pack up their stuff, put it in moving trucks, and they left. So I'd love to get your feedback on this story. Do you think that the house was indeed haunted? Or do you think there's some other explanation? Let me know in the comments and I will respond to all the early commenters. So get in there and give me your theories. If you enjoyed today's story and you haven't done this already, please take all of the like buttons, white articles of clothing and wash them with a bright red brand new t-shirt. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you have a story submission that you think could work on this channel, whether it's your personal story or just a suggestion, please go to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. I read it every single day. And if I intentionally use your submission, I will absolutely credit you. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content on TikTok. My username over there is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, some combination, I'm just very thankful for your support. And until next time, guys, that's going to do it. See ya.